Today, approximately one third of all nations on Earth are under sanctions by the US. This disproportionately affects poor countries, with over 60% of all poor countries, according to the World Bank, under US sanctions of some kind. Sanctions are often sold to us, the public, as an effective way of punishing bad behavior without the need for military action. However, the effectiveness of the sanctions needs to be questioned when we start looking at results such as these. In North Korea, sanctions have failed to halt their nuclear program. In Nicaragua, they haven't deterred their government. In Cuba, sanctions that were imposed by the United States more than 60 years ago have failed to dislodge their government. In Syria, Bashar al-Assad remains in power despite 20 years of UN sanctions. In Iran, US sanctions that date to the 1970s have not forced out their rulers. In Venezuela, sanctions failed to remove Maduro, who has recently been re-elected to a third term in the presidency. Hi guys, hello and welcome to another video. My name is Fernando Munoz and I would like to give you a quick reminder that I post this exact same contact in Spanish. So if you want to share this with your auntie or your uncle who doesn't speak English, feel free to click the link in the description to go to that channel and subscribe. Now, today we're going to be talking about US sanctions and the way that they enrich some people while they fail to accomplish their intended objective. In Washington, sanctions have created a very lucrative industry with certain foreign entities spending heavily to influence the system. Plenty of law firms and lobbying groups have built thriving practices by recruiting government officials to do the deed. One quick reference would be Mark Lukowitz, the president and CEO of Supima since 2016, who also serves as the chairperson of the Better Cotton Initiative. Remember that BCI was instrumental in banning Xinjiang cotton from the global supply chains, which directly benefited Supima, by the way. Supima is the marketing brand for American-grown Pima cotton, which is a direct competitor to the beautiful and great long-stem cotton produced in Xinjiang. Now you see how it works, right? Critics argue that US sanctions can backfire in a different set of ways. For instance, they can inadvertently strengthen target economies by forcing them to seek new economic partners, often leading them to increase economic resilience and diversification of their economies. While sanctions on Russia, for example, have affected their economy without a doubt, high global energy prices have partially offset some of the negative impacts, particularly when it comes to government revenue. The sanctions have also led to closer ties and trade with China and has led to illicit oil trade with India, according to the sanctions, right? Which decided to capitalize on the opportunity to secure cheaper oil, reducing its energy costs. And this financial advantage is what has contributed to India's economic growth by boosting industrial capacity and consumer spending, ultimately being responsible for driving the GDP upward. But as you would have guessed, we have yet to hear about sanctions on India. Now, in addition, sanctions can harm allied nations that do business, regular business, with sanctioned countries, straining their relationships and causing economic difficult for difficulties for those countries. Think of the sanctions on China Xinjiang and the trouble that it has caused to Volkswagen or Bas from Germany, or the effect that it had on the global fashion industry with Western brands and retailers such as Adidas or Nike, H&M, having been caught in the crossfire and some of them facing consumer backlash in this 1.4 billion people market. Furthermore, such measures tend to be perceived as acts of aggression. They fuel nationalism within the target country and they hinder brand efforts in doing better in the country. You can look, for example, at Apple and how it's been dropped out of the top five mobile phone brands in China, or how Tesla sales have dropped in China as well. This is all a consequence of, well, certain nationalism just coming to the surface. Over-reliance on sanctions has also damaged America's global reputation, and it has weakened its diplomatic influence. These sanctions tend to complicate diplomatic relations. They hinder cooperation on critical global issues and create opportunities 
for these rival powers that they're trying to, to slow down because they just feel the void that has been left by the United States. One example is climate change, where sanctions have hindered cooperation on vital issues like the development of clean energy technologies. Today, China is, without a doubt, the world leader in manufacturing and implementation of solar, uh, wind and energy, uh, EV batteries, and uh, the electrification of its fleet. They've also have amazing breakthrough technologies like the self-cooling nuclear reactors. So China is now set to dominate these markets around the global south, while the US simply continues to hide its lack of competitiveness behind protectionism. Another example of this lack of cooperation is the space exploration. Right now, there are Western astronauts who are stuck in space indefinitely, but they cannot ask Russia or China for help. Hopefully, this is going to be sorted out soon. But yeah, there's also the International Space Station, which is destined to be decommissioned very soon. It will be made to crash to Earth in January of 2031. Well, China's Tiangong started operations just in 2022 and 2022, sorry, and is expected to operate well into the mid-century. But no cooperation is allowed between U.S. and China, according to the Wolf Act. These are just U.S. laws that forbid this kind of cooperation. And finally, sanctions often tend to create black markets and illicit trade networks, which undermine the intended goal and potentially end up empowering criminal organizations around the world. But the one risk that affects almost every nation on Earth is the dollar's dominance in global trade and its use in commodity pricing. This financial power creates risks for U.S. adversaries as well as allies because dealing in dollars requires you to be compliant with U.S. rules and allies can often be found to be guilty by association. We've noted that we have a wide, broad net uh, with our sanctions and so we've warned people, be careful. Um, not to get caught in that net by activities that you may think don't come uh, into it, but actually are caught by it. So, Countries around the world are finding dollar dependence dangerous, risky, lending them to seek alternative trading methods such as the CIPS, the cross-border interlink payment system from China. Today, CIPS is used for clearing and settling cross-border RMB payments. It's very good because it simplifies trade transactions between China and other countries, reducing costs and improving the efficiency of the payments. It also contributes greatly to the development of offshore RMB markets and financial centers, making the Chinese currency more appealing to the international market. So both CIPS and, in the future, a BRICS currency will end up undermining U.S. ability to unilaterally punish nations and cause then the demise of countries that it opposes ideologically. That's a huge positive for these new spaces that are being opened around the world. And believe it or not, sometimes there are <laughs> places that offer unexpected resistance to sanctions. Remembering 2014, Russia's annexation of Crimea presented a significant challenge because when the U.S. targeted this major economy, it created the risk of a global market instability. And very soon, problems started to emerge because European leaders were objecting to the fines that they were placing on the European banks, the same as Wall Street, because they were complaining about the costs of having to comply with all these checks that were required by the U.S. But despite these warnings about sanctions and uh, them overreaching, Biden imposed over 6,000 sanctions in two years, more than any other president in the last 12, 15, 20 years. But before we go, well, the United Nations Charter on its Chapter 7 authorizes the Security Council to impose sanctions to maintain or to restore international peace and security as well as the WTO, the, the World Trade Organization, that generally supports the use of sanctions as a means of enforcing trade obligations. The issue resides both in the manipulation 
of these institutions at the hands of the United States and in the United States imposition of unilateral sanctions. These are sanctions that are not authorized by the United Nations Security Council. I have a monumentally revealing video coming up soon discussing Chapter 7 and the sanctions that were imposed on Iraq. I will be joined by Mr. Hussein Askari, who is the vice chairman of the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden. He is also the West Asia coordinator for the International Schiller Institute. He is a strategic and economic analyst and a journalist. He will be helping me understand the potential illegality of the U.S. government conduct vis-a-vis -vis oil from Iraq. So you do not want to miss that video. So make sure to subscribe in order to see that when it comes out. That is all the time we have for today, guys. Make sure to like, comment, and share. And if you want to support my work, the link is in the description down below to buy me a cup of coffee. And until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.